Now, they spend an entire year trapped in the ice of the Arctic. Hundreds of scientists from 20 different countries camped out in extreme temperatures. Living through months of complete darkness and the constant threat of polar bears, they studied the ice sheets surrounding them, checking the consistency, examining the atmosphere and the movement of the ocean. The German-led exhibition returned just last week, and we can speak to one of the scientists who took part now, Miss Stephanie Arndt. You were a sea ice scientist, but tell us firstly on a human level, what was it like to spend weeks and months even trapped in that Arctic ice? I'm thinking of the darkness, the cold, the threat of those polar bears. Well, it's actually really nice. I mean, you're in an environment that is kind of still untouched. And uh, you see that broad, yeah, white, white life, um, white continent almost. And it's it's just amazing to see that. And it's also, um, we, we all know that due to the climate change we currently go through, we might be the last generation seeing that um, Arctic Ocean and the North Pole still ice covered. And therefore, it's something really special. Gosh, you're, you're echoing really what one of the leaders of the exhibition seemed to suggest, that the ice in the Arctic really is dissolving much faster than we expected. He said it could be gone within the next couple of decades. Yes, that's unfortunately true. I mean, we went already through all these changes in the Arctic climate system. We observed the strong decrease in sea ice extent over the last decades. And therefore, we might run into the point that we might be on an ice-free Arctic Ocean um, in a couple of decades, as Marcus Rex said. Um, and this is what we, of course, want to avoid. But this is also something that we need to study more in detail and to make politicians and society aware of this situation. Because I imagine it, it seems to be shrinking even faster than we had initially feared. Are humans the main culprits? Well, of course, I mean, it's in the end and, uh, yeah, a combination of different factors. But of course, the humans and the, the way we are currently living, this is one of the major reasons why we see that strong climate change and why we do, that, uh, why, why we do see the signal of this uh, climate change that's strong in the Arctic climate system, yes. And now, I believe you're one of the heads of the snow or the snowfall team, if you like. Can you give me an idea of what exactly did you do with your days up there in the Arctic? And, you know, I believe you've brought back a fridge full of snowflakes. Tell us a bit more about the <laughs> test you're, you're hoping to carry out. Yeah, so on the one hand, I deal with the, sea, uh, with the snow depth distribution, meaning that we went every week the same transect across our um, mosaic ice flow and to see how the snow depths changed over the course of the year. And on the other hand, we did a lot of snow sampling for physics and chemist, uh, uh, chemistry analysis, meaning that we looked into really the grain sizes, the density, the temperature profiles, but on the other hand, also took samples for health for later analysis in the lab. And I think one really, really prominent example um, is the like carbon. So um, stuff that is coming from the continents um, also to the central Arctic, even though it's not meant to be there. But this is also something that we sample over the course of the year to see whether we see that the like carbon stuff in the central Arctic, because this has, of course, also implications for the color of the snow and therefore then for the um, solar radiation transport in terms of like what is what is back, what is back reflected uh, or how much light is going into the snow and then into the upper ocean. And can you tell us a bit more about even, I know it will take a, a long time to analyze all of the data that the, the exhibition broke back, but initial ideas, initial conclusions about this uh, black carbon, you know, where it might have come from, is it greater than you expected? And, you know, what can be done? Well, so far, especially on the black carbon, we can't take any conclusions as really those samples just arrived last Monday with Polar Stern, Becky and Bremerhaven. What we can say in general on conclusions for the sea ice physics group, um, what we saw is a really dynamic Arctic uh, sea ice um, area. So this is really kind of the new Arctic meaning they had already trouble to find in uh, September, October last year, uh, they had really trouble to find a suitable ice flow for this big um, experiment because due to the fact that it is warming, the ice is also forming later in the year and therefore in the end of September, beginning of October, the ice was still rather thin and the ice flows uh, rather small. And this dynamic pattern kind of um, evolved over the course of the year, meaning that we had through the entire time really high dynamics. We were moving much faster uh, with the ice. So the drift velocity of the ice flows was much higher than it was, for example, uh, like 120 years ago. 
um, when Fridjof Nansen did, this, uh, did a similar experiment. Um, and this is really, those are, yeah, um, signs showing us that the Arctic is changing and that, and this, uh, that these um, yeah, situations are what we are in general facing. And, and what impact, you know, remind us of the, how much power our poles have on the lives we live uh, many, many miles away from them. Um, well, it has a really, really big impact because we are actually, in the end, uh, really connected through the atmospheric and ocean circulation pattern. We are connected with the entire world. And the Arctic is the area where really kind of our weather is made um, for the mid-latitudes here in Europe. Um, and therefore, when we observe, observe these changes in the Arctic, those are immediately feedback uh, uh, into our climate. And this is what we also uh, saw, for example, last summer when we had those really strong warm periods and really dry periods here in, the, in, in mid Europe. And this is really connected to what happened in the Arctic because it's really, even though it sounds a little bit weird, but what happened in the Arctic doesn't stay there. And therefore, it's really important to understand these changes, because in the end, what we want to do with those um, results is that we want to improve our climate models. But especially in the Arctic, the climate models have their biggest uncertainties. And therefore, this is the aim now to improve that, because this allows us then also to get a better idea of the future climate of our um, planet, so uh, of our latitudes. And therefore, uh, yeah, this was kind of one of the aims of the experiment in general. Mm, to understand that vicious circle and see what we can do. But what can we do at this stage, apart from, of, of course, uh, we all take the responsibility to maybe reduce our greenhouse gases. But I've also been reading ideas like having glass powder scattered over the Arctic. You know, are there other <laughs> measures that may come into effect? And what do you think of those? Well, no, I mean, it's really in the end a small thing is what we can do in our own countries. But then we have to see it, of course, on a global level, because we have, of course, the big players in um, also in Asia and Africa, countries that might be not able um, because of their financial um, situation or their, their general uh, situation and economy, that they are not able to, to do the same measures as we can do. But therefore, I think it's important that we support also those big continents to do not only our own improved um, energy budget in the end or how we how we work and how we how we live but this this that we improve also the same for other um, countries that need, that needs more support I think this is in the end a big aim because it's in the end not an aim of single countries but it's a, a worldwide aim we should have Indeed, and as you've been explaining quite clearly, the the global impact that the, the differences have in various parts of our planet. And this exhibition, it's said to be uh, the longest or biggest uh, in history, and it was also a very international exhibition. Can you just give us an idea of how many of you took part and, you know, how it worked? Well, we've been, um, like... On board the ship, we've been between 415 scientists, scientists over the course of the year. And those scientists came from 20 countries, came from like 20 um, institute countries, but all over from more than 80 countries. So it was really highly international because otherwise this, this would have been not um, possible in terms of uh, funding, of course, also. But again, we see climate change um, and the, the improvement of the climate um, situation as in a worldwide effort and therefore this was of course also on board the case and therefore the entire team was really from all over the world. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Stephanie Arndt, a sea ice scientist, thanks so much for joining us and telling us a bit more about that exhibition that has just returned to Germany and of course with oodles of data that will take quite a long time to digest.